started on this live webinar from AISC Studios in Chicago, Illinois. It's the Structural Stability Game Show. Let's meet our contestants. Hailing from Atlanta, Georgia, he's one heck of a failure. Analyst. <laughs> when not reverse engineering a building collapse, he enjoys reading, hiking, and spending time with his family. Before opting for a more stable profession, he was vying to be an Olympic figure skater, eventually retiring to give the other athletes a fair chance. Currently a managing engineer with Exponent, everyone please welcome Cliff Bishop. Our next contestant is coming to us from Austin, that unique Texas city home to world-class barbecue and breakfast tacos. She's been known to hug seal columns while sampling beers at the local brew pub. Currently an assistant professor of structural engineering at the University of Texas, it's Trisha Clayton. Our next contestant is also from Austin, but born here in Sweet Home, Chicago. Once a young right-hander with a wicked sidearm 96 mile per hour fastball, now he's better known for hurling jabs at architects and contractors who don't follow the AISC code of standard practice on their structural steel projects. <laughs> From Walter P. Moore, please welcome Larry Griffiths. Our next contestant joins us from Seattle, Washington. He is the earthquake guy. He's an avid runner, expert hype man, a sucker for a good sunset, and one of Diet Coke's biggest fans. A senior principal with MKA and their director of earthquake engineering, everyone please welcome John Hooper. And now for the host of today's show. While at university in the early 80s, our host was the lead guitarist in the punk band Instability. <laughs> Unfortunately, around 1986, he developed a severe addiction to LRFD and was forced to leave the band. Unable to shake the habit, he put it to use by pursuing a career in teaching steel design. Currently a structural engineering professor at Buckling, <clears throat> check that, Bucknell University, Please welcome Ron Zemian. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Zemian. Take it away, Ron. All righty, folks. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Very interesting. Everyone, happy Steel Day. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we've got a bunch of contestants here, all up for the for the challenge. Uh, let me just check in with each one and say hello. Make sure you guys unmute yourselves. Cliff, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks, Ron. Uh, happy to be here, and thanks for having me. You bet. Tricia, what's going on there, Professor? How are things? Yeah, things are going great. It's steel day. I can't think of a better day to do this. Absolutely. Larry, talk to me. What's going on, buddy? I am present, uh, excited about this game show, and very stable. Ah, very good. Well, I guess that does it for Whoa, sorry, sorry. Got... Whoa, wait, 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 Ron. Uh, whoa, so sorry. Uh, John Hooper, yeah, that's who that is, the earthquake yeah. guy. <laughs> John, how are you? Doing great, trying not to rust in the rain here in Seattle. Ah, very good. All righty, folks. Well, we're in for a great show. Uh, let me explain how things are going to work here. Uh, basically, what you're going to see during the next 45 minutes or so are three case studies. I'll present the case studies um, after I'm done, and it won't take too long for me to do that. We'll go to each one of the contestants. The contestants will check in with what they think was the controlling mode of failure. Now, I want to emphasize here the contestants are not making up anything. Each one of their four opinions um, are realistic possibilities for what this failure, uh, how this failure could have occurred. Once uh, we're done with that, the contestants have checked in, then we're going to go to the audience. And we're very excited about this. The audience then is going to vote on what they think was the controlling failure mode. So in some part, they're voting to agree with one of the contestants. So we're going to be keeping track of how the audience does, as well as how the contestants do, as well as how the contestants do at convincing the audience. 
So it should be a fun show. Um, I know I'm really looking forward to it. Once the contestants have checked in, the audience have checked in, uh, then I will provide um, the actual root failure, and then I'm going to turn it over to Cliff, and Cliff's going to go through the case study in more detail, and um, we'll take it from there and move on to the next case study. So I hope those instructions are clear, and let's get started uh, with the first one. All right. So this is a, uh, a serious one. I believe there were injuries occurred, and uh, there may have been life lost. But uh, so as in every case, structural engineering, we realize we're designing for life and safety, and it just goes to drive home the point of how important the decisions we make during design and construction are. So let's uh, let's get started. It was a solar power support structure. Uh, it's located in, in uh, California, and essentially what's going on here is uh, we've got a tube of water, uh, and that tube of water is going to be suspended or was suspended from a, frame, from a set of frame towers. That tube of water then is well above the ground, and it's just uh, you know, well above a ground-mounted solar reflectors. Now, these solar reflectors are in the form of some type of a parabolic dish, so when the sun rays hit them, they're all focused on that tube of water. Once that tube of water gets hot enough, it starts to bottle, uh, boil, and it generates some steam, and of course that steam can then be converted to power, and off we go. Uh, it's important to note, as I show this case study, uh, that um, there were three uh, similar rows that had already been constructed, and they were working on, on one of the final rows when the incident occurred. All right, so letting your eyes adjust to this photo, this is just sort of a schematic of one of the frames. As you can see, uh, they're very tall and quite slender. All right, they are constructed of tubular sections, and um, we've got them because they had to be delivered to the site. The whole structure is 57 feet tall, 28 feet wide, and to get them to the site, they had to come in parts. So we've got a lower leg. That lower leg is then attached to an upper leg. The upper leg then has a receiver unit sitting on it. That's where that tube is. And above that is a lifting uh, weldment that's used to place the structures. Um, so that's generally the, the setup. Uh, just a quick overview of the erection process. Uh, each one of the frames were put in place. As you can see, they're all lying on the ground there. Um, once all the frames have been constructed, uh, then it's time to erect them. And basically what happens is a crane lifts them vertical. Once they're vertical, uh, they're tied to the ground. And then using a, a chain and wench process, uh, the tube is then lifted up into the location where it's going to finally sit. And as you can imagine, and why we're looking at this failure, things didn't go well. So part way up, uh, they're lifting the tube here. You can see the tube. It's just below the height between the lower and upper legs there at that connection. They're lifting the tube. There's no water in it, but certainly the weight of the tube. And suddenly, as you can see, the frames buckled. All right. Uh, upon closer inspection, there were a bunch of weld failures. And I believe, yeah, there you go. You can see uh, one of those pictures there uh, showing the weld failures right at the intersection. And so that's, of course, you got some column buckling occurring and right at that intersection, sure enough, we broke a weld. All right. So that's the background that I'm going to give each one of you. And at this point, what I'd like to do is check in with each one of the contestants. And based on the very brief amount of information I've told you, but I think there's certainly enough there, I'd like you to uh, check in. So, John, you're up first. How do you, what do you think was the root cause of the failure? Well, yeah, real quick, Ron, being the earthquake guy, I'd like to blame it on an earthquake ground shaking. That didn't happen. But if you remind everyone about the previous slide, that weld failure was the cause. It wasn't a big enough fillet. It wasn't poorly. It was poorly placed potentially. 
and it snapped right between the upper and lower leg. So fundamentally, the cause of the failure is that weld you see on the screen. Yeah, that that's certainly a heavy weld failure there, John. We can see in that picture. Well, thank you for that, John. Uh, so uh, let's see. We're going to check in with John there, indicating a weld failure. The professor is up next. Tricia, what are you thinking? All right. When I first saw that photo of that tower, the first thing that jumped out at me is those spindly little spaghetti sticks that they call legs. These just looked uh, tiny, probably inadequately designed. You know, perhaps the engineer made some inappropriate assumptions when checking the buffing load of those legs. Um, you know, an easy place to go wrong is those those idealizations we often make for the boundary conditions. Maybe maybe they assumed the bottom was fixed when there actually was some rotation there, or maybe they assumed the top had the translation fixed and actually it could displace a little, but I think there was probably an inadequate design to those legs of the frame. All right, so you, you think it was in trouble from the beginning. All right, yeah. thank you, Tricia. All right, Cliff, what's your thinking? Thanks, Ron. I think that uh, this is related to poor construction sequencing. I, I think uh, the, the engineer probably got this right. It's pretty hard to, to, to screw up the, uh, the capacity checks, and I think the weld was fine. It's like a pretty beefy weld to me. I think it was just uh, erected uh, out of sequence. In other words, the contractor lifted the, uh, the weldman or lifted the A-frame assembly into place, and didn't brace the top of it before he started lifting the um, before he started lifting the pipes. And you know, when you have a 57 foot tall flagpole on spindly little legs, as Tricia said, uh, I, I think you would be expecting uh, a failure that we saw. All right. So yeah, definitely out of plane on that frame. It was quite slender. So I see what you're saying there that uh, poor construction sequencing uh, would. would would certainly be a possibility. So, all right, uh, that's three. Larry, number four here. What's your thinking? Yeah, Ron, uh, being a good wind engineer, as I take a look at this site, it's pretty apparent to me, A, we're in California, uh, where the Santa Ana winds are blowing, and, and we're also in a very open site. So it looks to me like what could have happened here is we had a wind blowing longitudinally down the line of these uh, towers and being very slender uh, round HSS sections, it, it looks like we had a vortex shedding phenomenon going on here. And we started a vibration in this environment where we had a, a slow but steady wind that induces vortex shedding vibration and so I'm going to go with the idea that we could be looking at a vortex shedding wind phenomenon failure here. All right. So, well, that, that is definitely complicated, uh, but um, could certainly make sense. Extreme weather could have been driving this. So. All right. Well, as I indicated before, first, thanks to contestants for their, uh, for their thoughts. And uh, all four of these, certainly a realistic possibility. I'm now going to uh, switch over uh, to the audience and um, see what the audience thinks. And so we're going to do a quick poll. And so be sure to vote which one you think. Was it A, a well failure, B, inadequate design, C, poor construction sequencing, or D, extreme weather? All right, let's start the poll, shall we, Nate? So, so, Larry, uh, it's always wind about you, right? You think it's a vortex shedding? Are you sure about that? John, I, what I do know, it's not an earthquake phenomenon. Well, I, <laughs> I, I readily admit that up front, but I don't, I'm not sure about the wind. We'll have to wait and see what the audience thinks. I, I know you're an earthquake guy, but, you know, from a wind perspective, there's a real possibility here. It's definitely a slender system, so it's quite interesting. Yep. Yeah, Cliff's got my interest peaked there with that bracing. So, all right, let's see how we did here. Ooh, very interesting. Uh, we had about 12% of the audience check in on a well failure. About 31% came in with poor, I'm sorry, with an inadequate design. 
And uh, looking down a little bit further, uh, poor construction sequencing was, uh, was received the most votes, but still only about 50% of the audience. And Larry, sorry to report, but you only grabbed about 6% there on those agreeing with you that it could be uh, extreme weather. So um, I think you've had a chance to think about it. Contestants, I want to let you know uh, the correct solution is sort of a shared one between uh, the professor coming in with inadequate design and uh, Cliff coming in with poor construction sequencing. So it was really a combination of those two uh, that uh, took this system down. So I'm going to turn it over to Cliff. Cliff, please take a few minutes, um, about three or four or five minutes, and just go through with us uh, what you all found upon a more thorough investigation. So Cliff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Ron. So let's start with what it wasn't, and that's the weld. And so how did we go about exploring this? Well, the nature of the way the system was constructed gave us some real insight into the weld. And so as Ron mentioned, the system, and as you saw in one of the photos, the system was actually uh, constructed on the ground. The pieces were, were fit up on the ground. And then the crane came and lifted the top of the weldment, the upper weldment, and, and lifted the crane vertically, or excuse me, lifted the tower vertically. And so in when that's, that, that process of lifting, the tower legs are subject to their own self-weight, right? They're, they're resting on the ground, and they have the crane picking at the other end, so you have a, essentially a simply supported-like structure that's bending. And the moment that is developed uh, across those wells, the maximum moment, is 95 kip inches. And so, again, that just kind of sets the, the, the idea of what type of forces we were seeing in these, in these elements. So next we said, all right, well, let's, let's look at what's really going on here. So if you want to, you know, if you can't test it, the next thing we do is take it to finite element land. And so we ended up modeling this connection here. And what we did is we then subjected that connection uh, to, a, uh, to a movement or basically a displacement at the top. And what you're seeing here is in the middle picture, is you're actually seeing uh, the stresses across the, uh, the section. Anything in blue has not quite reached yield yet, uh, and anything in white or uh, gray, excuse me, that's a gray, is fully plastified. And the last figure on the right is just a, a profile view to show you uh, that. And I can tell you that the, the overall geometry that we see here matched with the actual plate that we recovered from the site. So, Using those two pieces of information, we put together this slide. And so what we're seeing here is, is four different bars, and I'll just talk about this briefly. Uh, the weld design is the load that was to be on the welds uh, when this system was in use, so when it's operating and has the water in the tubes. And so we just normalized that to 1.0. The weld capacity, based off of the measurements and our finite element analysis as well, corroborate we had about nine times the capacity there. Uh, the tower tilt-up actually put almost six times the demand on it than the weld design itself, or excuse me, than the, than the weld, excuse me, than the tower was supposed to be operated under. And then lastly, the receiver load just prior to buckling was somewhere around a quarter of the design. So ultimately, the welds were sufficient, and the damage we saw was related to uh, the welds that we, excuse me, the, the broken welds that we saw were related to large displacements associated with, associated with the collapse of the structure. In other words, the structure came down and then the welds broke and not the other way around. One other, uh, you know, again, we, we also checked the design. And so in this case, we said, all right, uh, the system was, was not braced at the top, right? Uh, there's, these are just freestanding towers. And so we performed an analysis of the system and uh, we varied the out of um, the out of plumbness of the tower, as you, as you might as you might do in your designs, uh, with an out of straightness between the top and the bottom, assumed as L over a thousand. And as you might expect, I mean, this plot doesn't really tell you anything too exciting. Is that uh, the more the tower is out of plumb, right? The the for the same level of force, you're going to get more displacement at the top. So this is kind of something we expected, but we needed to kind of show how these plots varied for 
for an unknown amount of uh, initial imperfection. And so, again, the, the design was pretty adequate. Uh, if we just looked at three models, a self-weight only model that was unbraced at the top, we calculated you know, buckling load of 17.8 kips. The case two is the receiver is being lifted plus the self-weight of the tower is considered uh, for an unbrace is about 6.1. And the receiver uh, plus the self-weight, if it's braced at the top, is around 30 kips. And you'll see the, the weight of the tower plus the receiver is about 6.9. So essentially, uh, case two uh, never stood a chance, right? And when you started lifting the receiver, uh, you, you couldn't get this to work. So what does that mean? Well, it's an adequate design, right, we think. The designer CD and calcs included things like the analysis of the braced structure for lifting. So that means the engineer considered that the top of the tower was going to be braced during the lifting process. The only case that was considered unbraced was actually the case that Larry was talking about earlier, and that's the case of wind. So they considered it unbraced for wind. So, and in this, you might say, well, how did they get three of these built and the last one not built? Because the contractor said, we're delayed. Can we move along faster by not guying these towers, which they had done on the previous three? And the engineer wrote back, yes, you can do that. So, in this case, the engineer ultimately directed the contractor in the erection procedure. So, essentially, the engineer's fault. But then you might also say, well, the contractor did not consider the slenderness of the frame and double check the engineer, right? Maybe the contractor should have second guessed the engineer. So maybe it's the contractor's fault. I will just leave you on one parting thought. Uh, the, the person who, the engineer who signed off on this in the brace uh, condition uh, was a mechanical engineer, not a civil engineer. Uh, so maybe that'll make you feel a little better uh, that you probably would have gotten the oiler buckling load check and uh, would have noticed that this was going to fail before it happened. So, Ron, I guess I'm going to turn it back over to you for the next case. Very good. Well, thank you for that uh, thorough uh, description of what happened. Uh, certainly a very interesting case. Um, let's move on. So the second case uh, for our contestants here is a dome scaffolding collapse. Uh, first big mistake that they uh, did with these Dome these tanks as they built them out of concrete. So, of course, being steel day, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if these big tanks were done out of steel, but so it goes. We've got uh, seven digester tanks numbered from 17 to 23, so it makes me think there's a bunch more somewhere else. These are good sized tanks, 125 feet in diameter. So, what's that? About 40 yards. Uh, half a football field. They're about 50 feet tall, good size, and the uh, tanks are about uh, a foot thick. So uh, these, these are pretty hefty beasts. Um, the base, uh, a little bit difficult when you go to construct that roof system, so the base um, is slanted towards the inside, so uh, circumferentially slanting towards the inside uh, to bring all what's in there towards the middle to drain out or whatever's going on. Uh, to get that concrete roof system in place, uh, they used a set of aluminum false work uh, that was used to support the formwork and do the deck pours up top. Uh, tanks 17 and 18 had already been constructed. The roof decks had been poured. No incident. So, again, similar to that previous case study where there were some successes in, in the bank, but still a failure occurred. Tank 19 was ready for a concrete deck pour, um, and tanks 20 and 21 had the false work almost fully installed, uh, but they weren't quite ready for the concrete. So we're gonna focus on tank 19. Now at the time of the accident, they were placing that concrete up on the top of the tank, provide a roof system to the tank, uh, it was being placed moving north to south, so we're not going to do it circumferentially and move inward. It's one side all the way to the other. And about half of the concrete had been placed uh, when the accident occurred. So always tough for structural engineers to see pictures like this. 
um, here it is, the system collapsing, and you just uh, want to uh, sadly see uh, the, you know, only a portion of the system supported, and then looking inside there, uh, just a uh, horrible sighting of all that scaffolding collapsing and, and the like. So a messy picture, tough to look at. Uh, the failure, um, well, certainly uh, the false work uh, supporting uh, the, uh, was, uh, was plywood, so that's what was holding everything up and dropped in. Uh, there were 29 people on that roof deck. Uh, 14 of them were injured, four very seriously, and thank goodness none fatally. Uh, tanks 19, 20, and 21, right after that failure, were immediately put under a California OSHA order to preserve, which means everything stopped and nothing would continue until a thorough investigation uh, was completed. I want to show you a little bit about that scaffolding. So we're looking inside now. Uh, the plywood formwork up on the top for that concrete uh, was supported, the plywood was supported on top of aluminum beams. Uh, these aluminum beams were sort of layered on top of each other to get the loads over uh, to the shoring towers, which were also made out of aluminum. And um, that, that's the system. If we uh, have a look uh, from the, uh, the inside here at the shoring system, looking up at the top and down at the bottom were screw jacks. These screw jacks were needed because, again, the inside tank was tilting inward. Uh, let's see what else I've got for you. Um, many of the towers, by the time the screw jack was all the way up, it still could not reach the base of the aluminum beam. So they had to put in some substringers, and these substringers uh, could any be anywhere from 12 to 16 inches long, simply sitting on top of the screw jack and below and supporting the aluminum beams. Again, another picture of that uh, very slender scaffolding system and those screw jacks down at the bottom, which, oh boy, they look mighty slender down there. Uh, and again, they needed the screw jacks because the floor is not level. This is, uh, again, another tough picture to look at, look at but um, when you arrive at the site, this is what you saw, frames fracturing, welds fracturing, couplers failing, substringers at the supports failing, substringer web buckling occurring for those substringers that didn't just fall in. Uh, we've even got some cross brace connections. They were either missing or had also failed. So what was the cause of this failure? And that's why we've got these four contestants that are going to be working with us. And uh, let's see, Larry, you're up first. Larry, what are you thinking on this one? Well, Ron, I, I don't see any wind issues on this one. That's always my first thought. But uh, what I do see is a lot of questionable details in this uh, shoring system. And uh, the fact that you mentioned that the uh, planning on the height of, of some of the scaffolding wasn't the best in uh, there clearly was some last-minute decisions, and putting in this substringer at the top uh, to extend the, uh, the scaffolding uh, really creates a highly questionable detail. And it sure looks like uh, this one's a no-brainer in the sense that uh, we got a case of web crippling here, uh, or web buckling, uh, on these substringers, which clearly were an afterthought. So. I'm going to go on this one with uh, these top substringers being the source of this particular failure. All right, Larry, thank you very much. So, uh, a stringer web buckling is where you're checking in. All right, Tricia, what are you thinking? All right, Ron, do you mind going back to slide 36 for me? 36. I seconds, had one second. All right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I had the exact same feeling you you had. When I saw those screw jack ticks in, I thought, man, those are really slender. And they look, especially the ones closest to us, they look like they were extended really far, maybe too far. You couple that 
long unbraced lengths of those screw jacks at the base with the fact that they're sitting on wood that's cut at an angle on a smooth concrete surface. So it looks like they're just prone to kick out. So I think it was buckling started here at these screw jacks, which, which were extended out too far. All right, very good. So we got the screw jack extension buckling. Thank you very much, Tricia. John, what do you think? Well, I, well, I think both Mary and Tricia have some pretty plausible explanations. They're really focused on what happens locally at the stringer and the screw jack. But if you go back, uh, Ron, to slide number 36, if you would, for me, and look at the shoring towers. 36, yes, yes, yes. The shoring towers, the basic towers for which these little spindly things do sit. I do admit that. But you don't see any bracing between these shoring towers. They're spanning the entire floor of the height. And so I think they just miscalculated the unbraced length of each of the shoring towers. And each shoring tower needed to be braced in addition to what they don't have right now. And so it really was inadequate bracing of these shoring towers. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. Very interesting. Cliff, you're on board. What are you thinking, Cliff? Thanks, uh, Ron. I think it's uh, simply a case, even bigger picture than uh, than John's. I think it's just too much concrete. They, uh, the engineer didn't calculate this correctly. Uh, they started pouring the concrete. You got some deformations uh, in the shoring tower system uh, because the, the shoring towers are so high, as we've seen uh, a few times in that slide 36. And so what happened is you started to get a deflection and that required more concrete and you put in more concrete and then you got more load and that gave more deflection. And then essentially just too much concrete, too much weight, system came down. Uh, very interesting, Cliff. Yeah, combining that with the fact that they didn't uniformly load up the entire system, as we saw, they went south to north to south to south to north. Very plausible. So here, there are four here uh, that I don't know. Uh, let's let's see what the audience has to say. So we're going to jump over to the audience and ask them to check in. Uh, so what do you think, folks? Please vote. Was it stringer web buckling? B, screw jack extension? C, inadequate bracing of the shoring towers? Or D, there was just plain too much concrete up there and the system couldn't support it? Please start your voting. Well, being Ron, being steel day, you'd think it would be just too much concrete, right? It just doesn't fit. Yeah. I mean, so, can God, I you didn't see any too much concrete effects on this one? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no one noticed all of the uh, extra concrete trucks showing up, and so, uh, you know, <laughs> it's definitely the concrete. Yeah, I think a lot of steel people would always have that expression, too much concrete. <laughs> you can, just you can have steel course, without concrete. concrete. Yeah. You can say yeah. you can have steel yeah. without okay. concrete. You can't have concrete without steel. So there you go. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yep. That's why we're celebrating steel day. So John, you didn't see any earthquake in this one, did you? No, I thought about it. It's California, so that's plausible, but not this time. And there's certainly not wind. All right. The results are here. The results are in. Yes. Uh, here's how things came forward. Uh, Street web buckling. Larry, your numbers are low again, only 8%. Uh, Tricia, the professor has come through with their screw jack extensions. Inadequate bracing received, received a decent nod, so, John, you're getting on the scoreboard here a bit. And Cliff, they just weren't buying the too much concrete. So uh, let's turn it over to you, Cliff, and have you walk us through what actually took place. Uh, the uh, actual failure was indeed Larry on the scoreboard <laughs> with String Weber, <laughs> Weber Stringer Web Buckling. So now I'll go to Cliff for uh, give us some, some details on what happened. Cliff, you up for it? I'm ready. All right, please just take about a few minutes. All right, Cliff, we're running a little bit behind time. Sure, sure. So. There were many different failure modes and contributions that we considered. So I won't read them all here, but including those long screw jacks and overloading of the tower legs and, and basically everything that we've said, we tried uh, and investigated. And a couple of interesting thoughts here. The shoring system design. The maximum applied load per leg was 9,000 pounds and the allowable load per leg was specified at 8,800. 
Well, based on the the, the, the shoring system uh, calculations and the and the uh, and the setup that was used, it was a factor of safety of, uh, of at least 2.5. And therefore, the minimum capacity that we were expecting at ultimate per leg was 22,000 pounds. So we had something that had about 9,000 on it, was supposed to be about 22,000, or could have held up to 22,000, but wasn't able to do so. So the design drawing specified up to nine tier towers uh, with no outer frame bracing, and the six inch, 16 inch long substringers on top of the tower legs. So these were actually shown uh, in some of the design drawings. However, the effect of those substringers on the load was never calculated. And so again, here the issue was, is that you have a sloped floor, right? And you have towers of set height. And so you essentially have to adjust the screw jacks and add these, uh, these substringers where necessary to, uh, to get the shoring towers to stay in place. So here's a... a uh, what I want to get at here in this slide is this is the design demand. So on the left side, the original design was about 9,000 uh, pounds. Uh, there were other engineers working on this, and they calculated that the demand per leg was around, ranged from uh, about 11,000 to 12,400, depending on, you know, the spacing and the substringers. And we had calculated, again, in that same range, that, you know, 11,000 to, to 14,000. It's actually the load on the leg. And so remember, again, we're comparing this to the 22,000 that we expect uh, from, uh, from the calculations. So the actual loads, excuse me, that was the design. The actual loads that were on there um, were around 7,200, so a little bit less. Uh, and again, what we actually calculated for those uh, capacities. So uh, we can, I know we've got to pick it up a little bit. So conducted, we actually conducted full-scale testing uh, we were incrementally loaded. This, this is actually a, a test setup we made, and we actually incrementally loaded these to failure. And essentially, the web buckling of the substringer is what led to a global collapse. The peak loads that we, were, that we got on these legs were around uh, uh, 14,000, 13,000. And then the failure loads significantly below the design level of 22,000. So let's do the video. I'm going to show you a video of our test. Okay, should be. And all the video is going to show is it's pretty it's pretty boring until it happens. So just take a look uh, at the video. I won't I won't talk over it, but just to let you know that we're loading, we're loading, and then we get a uh, a failure in the web stringers. All right. So we prepared a finite element of the, of the system to check out uh, the, the bracing that was used and to, and to kind of look at it from, again, uh, from a finite element land. And again, uh, we looked at all these different variables. And the, the, the main crux of, of the results is, um, is here and showing that the design load um, Again, design allowable is 8,800. The minimum ultimate was around 22,000. And you can see here, uh, all, the, all the starting from the third on the third from the left, all of these bars indicate different things that we looked at. And again, the screw jacks uh, did have some effects. The no bracing in the outer frame did have some effect, but it's really the substringers that drove the bus on this. So that's the end of, of this one. And I'll turn it back over to. Um, to Ron to start case three. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Cliff. Uh, yeah, that one always reminds me of Cody. You've got to be very careful whenever you run a wide flange section over the top of a column and make sure that thing is properly secured and properly braced. So, very interesting. Um, our last case study, and folks will need to move along fairly quickly through this one, but uh, it's a building roof collapse. Uh, it was in an office building in suburban Oklahoma. There's a picture from the outside, and more difficult to see is the picture from the in, uh, from the roof. Uh, here, uh, what would happen is there was a severe rain event, and uh, during or shortly after this severe rain event, the roof partially collapsed. And you can see the portion collapsing here. 
If you go inside, and this is a, another area not right at the collapse or right near the collapse, you can see some of the failure that has taken place. There is a, a, a screw jack that has been placed just temporarily to hold that open web steel joist up. It's important to see that the open web steel joist uh, at the joist seat, it has come off um, the, the header that was supporting it. So let me show you a picture here, um, how the design worked. We had an exterior facade. We had stud walls in place. We need something to support that open web steel joist. Unfortunately, it falls between the stud walls. So they provided a, a secondary system to support the truss. Uh, on the load from the truss is now bearing uh, on top of that header, and then it will find its way left and right into that truss support system. So here is a photograph of that. Uh, again, the joist seat, uh, meaning to sit on the entire set of back-to-back -back, uh, angles. Uh, not quite clear whether it achieved that, but nevertheless, that was the goal. The load from the joist seat from the entire truss then needs to go left and right uh, into those supporting columns uh, that were prepared. A uh, little more uh, views from the uh, inside. If you take a close look at the photo in the right, this is one that didn't come right down uh, but was about to. You can see quite a bit of crushing uh, of that header. So the header, again, made out of uh, coal form uh, section that were angle uh, channels that were faced toe to toe. All right, so with that brief overview, uh, contestants, can you give me a quick check-in? Uh, how, how are things going? What, what are you seeing? Let's see. Let me uh, check my records here. Trisha, you've been pretty convincing this far along. The audience tends to be agreeing with you a lot. What's your thinking on this one? You know, I got to say, this is probably not the structural engineer's fault. It was Oklahoma, rainy season. Yeah, I think that this is a case of you know, maybe there were some drains clogged on the roof. Big rainstorm came in. Maybe the scuppers on the side didn't allow all that water out. So just the rain loads and the ponding was more than what was considered in design. So an overload on the roof due to the rainstorm. Very interesting, Tricia. Thanks. Thanks for that insight. Cliff, where are you going? Uh, I think uh, the support that was missing, the, the one drawing or slide you show, I think it was 61. Uh, there was supposed to be a support directly under the truss location or an additional stud. That was never installed. Uh, so, again, you probably didn't calculate to have this, uh, this little box header, I suppose you call it, in, in bending. It was supposed to just transfer the load directly down into the stud, but the stud wasn't there. So I think uh, it's that missing support that caused it. All right. Thank you, Cliff. John, you and Larry are struggling oh, yeah. a bit here with points. So let's put one on the board, shall we? I will try. It, it can't be the rain. Those roofs are designed for that, Tricia. No offense. You go to slide 62 <laughs> real quick one more time, and you can see the box header. It is crushed like you had described. It's really just a matter of the local member effects, Ron and team. Mm -hmm. uh, not designed to consider the web buckling and crippling. It, you, you can see it's just squashing right there. So it really was an inadequate header, it, it not taking account the web buckling and crippling effects. I'm, I'm sure of it. All right, John, thank you very much. Larry, you're up. What are you thinking, Larry? Well, I hate to say it, but, uh, you know, I could agree with, with John here, but I think overall this is a pretty pretty questionable design. I mean, it, it just shows you got to get the right engineer on the job. And clearly the guys that looked at this one didn't get all the design requirements uh, checked, and so I, I think we should say overall this is just an improper design. All right, Larry, so it just was never going to work, so... Again, four very plausible solutions. Uh, there is a, a root failure. I'll describe that. But uh, first, let's go to our audience, see what they're thinking. So one more time to take your poll. Please vote. What did you think was the root cause? A, a freak storm. The system was overloaded, and the structural engineer just had no chance. Missing support, so improper construction. 
local member effects. We basically crushed the web of that uh, C shape um, or C shapes, depending if the load is actually in both of them. And then going into Larry with just an overall improper design, uh, that's that's not the way to do it. So, um, folks, please check in and let me know what you've got. So, John, no earthquake on this one, right? Yeah, I thought you would go with tornado. I really thought you would since it's Oklahoma, but you didn't go there. So. Oh, that one, I, I didn't see any effects of a tornado there, but I, you know, I could have gone with the earthquake one, though. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you oh, could have oh, they do exist. Yeah, they do. Here they are the results. Do. All right, we've got some results. Uh, freak storm, only about 10% thinking that. Uh, missing support, they weren't buying that one either. John Hooper with a big score here. Audience tending to agree, local member effects. Yeah, 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 seeing that crushing. And then some combination of that. Larry, you did get some points, 25% there. Uh, again, improper design could indicate that that local member buckling was, was controlling. So, uh, yep, in effect, uh, the correct answer was local member effects. So, John? You got a score there. Congratulations to the audience that agreed with them. And I have to say, the improper design was fairly close. So let's jump over. Yeah, Cliff, anxious to take it at it. Give us a few minutes, Cliff, on what happened. All right. Thank you, Ron. So as we said, this was a, um, a, a web crippling effect. And so this is kind of a mix. There was some other construction error, but it wasn't one of the choices we gave you. But instead of being a fully boxed, a box header that was supposed to be installed at these locations, uh, we ended up with two horizontal strut with, excuse me, two horizontal studs uh, framing between the vertical components. And so therefore the, the flexibility, the in connections, uh, we were able to get web uh, buckling a lot easier uh, than we were before. All right, so a couple things, uh, how we looked at this, we ignored the open section for the calculations right now. It's kind of an upper bound of our estimate, right? And then we went through and made some calculations. So the allowable load uh, per, per the rain loading was supposed to be about 1.9 kips. Uh, we calculated the capacity of around three and a half. Uh, the non-factored loads, so the actual loads that were there uh, were around four. So we did have some, uh, we did have a, a, lot, of, a lot of water uh, on, the, on the roof. The building officials or BOCA requires um, that at least it stands two and a half times the live load uh, when, you, when you test it. And the reason we checked this is because uh, we were getting an expert uh, report um, from, or from, from other people working on the project that said that the, you know, this couldn't have been web crippling because uh, you had 7.4 kips of capacity. So interestingly enough, if, if you go to some, some look at, excuse me, the tests that were produced, uh, the test indicated the capacity of the bearing assemblies was at least 7,500 pounds, uh, which is sufficient to meet the building code. So that was the argument. Uh, then later on, we got the, this table. And so you can see the capacity of 7,429, 70, although we have two tests which occurred at much lower values, which is kind of, which is kind of odd to me to report uh, the highest and not the lowest value that you received. But that's what we had. And so furthermore, uh, I think right before trial, uh, we got some videos. And these are actually the failure, the failure modes of the three, uh, the three different cases that were tested. And what's interesting to note here is, especially in the middle photo, where is the web? <laughs> the stud is completely crushed. And so, of course, if you continue to load in a test, test apparatus, if you look at the top right one, you continue to load and load and load, uh, essentially your load point is just bearing on the additional studs below. And so what we saw was what is this design strength? Well, web crippling occurred somewhere around here, but the reported strength was reported somewhere around here, uh, simply meaning that, again, at some point the, uh, the uh, the trusses themselves were bearing on the studs directly. So of course you'd have a higher load at that point. 
And also, again, the reported strength occurs at this large displacement. And what does that mean? Well, that means that once the web crippling occurred, to get to this strength, you would have a lot of rotation, right? And that rotation would then al allow the joist to essentially slip off the bearing, which is what we saw in, in, in this analysis. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ron to let him finish this up. All right, Cliff, thank you very much. Yeah, that one is very interesting how, how that played out. Uh, some closing remarks, of course, where do you go on steel day, but all the way back to the father of stability, Leonard Euler. And since the fabric of the universe is most perfect and is the work of the most wise creator, nothing whatsoever takes place in the universe in which some relation of maximum and minimum does not appear. So we saw some maximums exceeding minimums, and down came the system. So I want to thank the audience for their participation. I'd also uh, like to reach back to our contestants and just check in. Uh, each of you fared well. Each of you got on the scoreboard correctly with a correct uh, input. Uh, my last notes indicated that it was indeed the professor who was most convincing and so, Tricia, congratulations on that. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Cliff Bishop at Exponent. Cliff, um, these were three great case studies and very much appreciated that your firm was uh, allowed you, you to share them with us, and thanks for putting those details together. Uh, we do plan to do a similar show at the upcoming NACC in Louisville, and we've got a whole new set of case studies coming from West Gen. Jenny Elsner on that day. So I think at this point, um, I did receive a few questions. I see the time is about uh, 55 minutes, so I think we're pretty close to staying on schedule. Uh, Cliff, question for you. Um, the other contestants certainly have experienced this perhaps as well in their investigations, but in the first two, there were situations in which other systems had already been built and survived, but then going on to another one, it failed. Now, you did provide us some reasoning in the first one of um, they tried to cut some corners during erection, and it really bit them in the butt, not providing some temporary bracing. The question from the audience was, what happened in the second one? Uh, those tanks, um, we've already got some tanks that, came together and did not collapse with that shoring system. And doggone it all, you go to the third one, and sure enough, it came down. Any thoughts on why the first two were able to survive? Yeah, that, uh, so thanks for the question, and thanks, Ron. Uh, th it's kind of interesting because we, we, we wrestle with that. And again, I think the first one was pretty direct, right? It was that the engineer, uh, that the contractor was behind schedule, and they asked the engineer, and the engineer said, uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, but the, really the second one uh, it was a little different, and I think it was just that you the loads and the capacities as best that we could uh, best that we can calculate them with our engineering uh, analysis and judgment were just right on the cusp of being okay. And so you you get you know a shoring tower that's moved one foot in any direction, maybe that's the impetus. Or you get a screw jack that's, that's three inches longer. Or you have a wet stringer that isn't positioned in the center at, at one place. And so essentially when, you're, when, you're, when your capacity is sitting right at your demand level, uh, all you need is, is the butterfly flapping its wings in Madagascar to cause the whole system uh, to come down. It's, in other words, it was just waiting to happen, and why it made made it through two and didn't make it through the and happened on the third one um, is really anybody's guess. So I hope that's yeah, hope that's a reasonable answer. <laughs> no, certainly. Um, yeah, they were. I guess what I'm hearing is they were just very lucky it didn't happen, but then unfortunately their luck ran out. So uh, I have a question, not really a question, but uh, certainly one of the audience members on that first day and seeing. The numbers spent way over. Boy, it was just an absolute clear illustration of the P-delta effect and uh, what can go on. Larry, um, I know I've wrestled with you on this P-delta effect. Did, did you see all that bending up at the top before that thing came over? Any thoughts on the P-delta effect for today? 
Yeah, no, the the whole the whole uh, observation on that one is it looked like a fairly scary design, and uh, you know I'm not sure uh, an engineer with using all of his engineering judgment would have made everything quite as slender as we saw there. Uh, so the question is how how much analysis was really done on that, and how accurate was that analysis in the original design? Yeah. Very difficult. I'm going to try to jump back a slide here. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, the I believe what I want to have a look at are those stringers uh, that were sitting on top of the columns there in the second one. Cliff, is there any chance uh, we can go back and you can play that video again? We were a little rushed, and I think we've got a minute or two. Now we could just show it again. I'm going to try to bring it up for you as soon as I can find it. Yeah, here it is. Uh, so, Cliff, uh, I'm going to sure. see what happens here. All right. So, go ahead and I can't see what you're seeing. Is the video playing? Uh, yes, Ron, it's, it's ready to go. All right. So, go ahead and hit the go button there, Cliff, and let's watch this thing. Yeah, so it should be, should be playing now. Uh, and so hopefully if you haven't, hopefully you've seen, seen it now, but what you see there is actually a twisting and collapse of it. So basically uh, the two flanges twisted relative to one another and then crushed the web in between them. Oh boy. So that one's even tougher. So yeah, I mentioned the possibility of running an eye shape across the top of a column. Um, there it would be just web crushing. Here we had on the crossing combined with the possibility it was short enough that it could actually twist. So, yeah, that was that was very interesting. We did get a nice shout out uh, from one of our audience members. Where would the world be without steel? Very nice. And I think we'll we'll end it on that. Um, Nate, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And thanks to our contestants and audience. And happy Steel Day. Everybody.